Good morning and welcome to Zion's virtual worship on this 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. Um, a word of note, throughout this video you might see or hear individuals that are here in the church and don't feel like you've missed service. Uh, as a public speaker it's incredibly difficult to preach out over an empty room and so my family has graciously accepted my invitation to be here to give me somebody to physically preach to. Um, some announcements today. Uh, we'd like to thank you very much for your generous offerings. In-person in -person worship uh, will not be held next Sunday on the 15th as well. Um, I have heard from more than a few of you uh, expressing some concern about going back to virtual church. I think that the joy that we can find in this is that for now it's only two weeks and we'll be able to hopefully get together uh, and worship together on Christ the King Sunday on the 22nd. Um, I do not see any other announcements this morning, so let us come together in confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved. Amen. Amen. Holy One, we confess that we are not awake for you. We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides our beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighborhood. Open, Open your, your hands, hands to serve, serve your creation. creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven. By Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
us pray. O God of justice and love, you illumine our way through life with words of your Son. Give us the light we need and awaken us to the needs of others. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. From Amos, chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. In the days of Amos, people thought that the day of the Lord would be a time of great victory. But Amos announced that it would be a day of darkness, not light. He said, liturgy is by no substitute for obedience. The Lord demands justice and righteousness in the community. Verse 18. Alas for you who desire the day of the Lord. Why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light. As if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear. Or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of the well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a voice strong and clear Ringing out far and near Let justice roll down Let justice roll down Like the rush of a stream Comes a powerful dream Let justice roll down Every soul be reformed. Let the healing renew creation reborn. Here in this sacred space, with the strength of God's grace, let justice roll down. Justice roll down. Let 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Please stand. Jesus said to the disciples, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps have gone out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You'd better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The Gospel of the Lord. So as you know, I am a father of three boys. They're all here today, and I appreciate that. Two of these children are currently teenagers. And if you've ever raised teenagers, um, let's just say we have been blessed with many learning opportunities in our household. For me and for them. 
so you need to pray for my wife. But through the course of the day or the week, as we get to practice conflict resolution and lessons of loving thy neighbor and completing our chores and serving each other, there are times that my boys will hear me speak how great it feels to have fun once the work is done. Just this week, my boys have heard me say, work first, play later, more than a few times during our morning routine. It's a hard concept to get sometimes. But should we decide to engage in the fun now, knowing that the work needs to be done, the, the joy of that play is diminished a bit. It isn't quite as fun. There's something hanging over our shoulder that keeps nagging at us that something needs to be done. If, however, if we complete all of our tasks and get the work done first, the play is all the sweeter, with nothing looming over us to distract us from the fun. But that takes intention, and it takes discipline, and it takes being prepared. To prepare, it, it seems like such a small phrase to explain such a complex idea. Regret, that too is a small word. It seems insufficient to describe such an ocean of emotion. So I'm going to share another phrase that is tossed around our house quite a bit. You have two options, discipline or regret. That is another gem of wisdom from my wife. Discipline or regret. In chapters 23 through 25, these are the final teachings of Jesus in the gospel, in this gospel. Jesus began his public ministry in this gospel with a lengthy discourse called the Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7, and it closes with this lengthy discourse that is sometimes called the Judgment Discourse. Chapters 25 through 23 through 25. Chapter 26 moves on to the preparation for Jesus' crucifixion. So we give special credence to the things that people say as they prepare to die. Because a dying person wants to impart some special love or special wisdom, something important before dying. This judgment discourse then gains significance as Jesus' dying words to his disciples. The most important wisdom that he could possibly provide for them. This parable today has a twofold message. It is a parable about the worst kind of lost opportunity. But it is also a parable that each and every individual, without exception, is responsible for his or her own spiritual preparation. This means that none of us on Judgment Day, none of us will find themselves in heaven accidentally. Or they will not find themselves in hell accidentally. In the previous chapter, Jesus answers the questions about the signs of his coming and the end of the age. He indicates in chapter 24 the signs that, would be, that we should look for to herald his coming. It includes times of abandoning religious beliefs in verses 3 through 4, people being led astray in verses 11, anarchy in verses 6 through 8, apathy and affliction of the saints in 9 through 10. Jesus made it clear that he is going to come back, literally, bodily, physically, certainly. He's coming to reward the righteous and to punish the wicked. And he also said that there would be a delay. And this is where he started giving a series of warnings, warnings to be ready, warnings to not be like the wicked servant, warning that his coming is certain, but not the day and not the hour. But if we have learned anything from these passages, it is this. We should love the reappearing of Jesus. We should crave it. The certainty of his coming should motivate us to be obedient and loving and caring. 
The ultimate form of preparation that we can have is to accept Christ as your personal Savior and Lord. And just like anything in our lives, it requires preparation. Planting a garden requires preparation. Marriage requires a preparation. Getting ready to go out to dinner requires preparation. Getting this service together, this message, knowing that I was going to be emotional about not being able to look over the pews and see my church family, that required preparation. In Matthew 25, Jesus says this preparation requires us to be saved in verses 1 through 14. To be responsible stewards that we will find out next week in verses 14 through 30. And that we need to be servants in verses 31 through 46. There are many levels that we must realize and wrap our mind around personal preparation. And it begins with this parable. And as I mentioned before, stories are meant to capture us in meaning. Jesus' parables were earthly stories that reveal a heavenly truth. There are times we hear this specific parable and believe that we are being called to solely prepare and await the coming of Christ, but I'm not so sure that's the entire message. The call for preparation should have occurred throughout chapter 14 or 24. No, now we are seeing the folly of those who went through the motions, the folly of those who did not prepare, who did not carry their faith with them, who placed earthly things above heavenly gifts, who focused on the distractions of the world as opposed to what truly matters. There was a Sunday when I was younger, uh, and I was sitting next to my grandmother, and she was exceptionally fidgety. And it was clear she was very distracted. My grandmother loved to wear purple. Purple was her color. And on this particular Sunday, she was wearing a purple blouse that was, that was loaded with purple sequins along the shoulder and in the arm. And every time that she fidgeted, she would scrape me with these razor-sharp sequins along my arm. And I felt she was going to be doing irreversible damage to my arm. I thought perhaps I would bleed out right there in the pew. And at the end of the church service, I went up to her and I said, are, are you okay? Is everything okay? I noticed you were a bit distracted. She replied, no. No, I am not okay. Betty over there is wearing a shirt that looks almost exactly like mine. And Betty knows that I wear purple to church. I did not ask her what she thought of the pastor's sermon uh, because I feel like I knew what the answer would have been. What sermon? The distractions of this world take us away from Christ, from preparing the way for the Lord. There is a consistent message throughout the Bible telling us to be prepared. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Colossians chapter 3, set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. Proverbs chapter 4, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Luke chapter 10, verses 42 Jesus says, you are worried and distracted by many things, but there is need for only one thing. Make no mistake about it, Christ is coming. He has made that truth crystal clear. And it's our job to keep our eyes on what is truly important, what is truly going to bring life, what will truly grant us eternal life, and that is Christ. The temptation of this life, of this time, is to think that we have time to prepare. That we have time to put it off. To give our attention to earthly matters. And focus on the wrong thing. To focus on this life at the detriment to the life that is after. Procrastination is a way of life. I'll think about that later. I did hear somebody say once that the older we get, the wiser that we are 
And so procrastination isn't necessarily bad. I'm just putting off doing that thing until I am older and I am wiser. This parable says no. No. That gamble is unworthy of you. The time is now. The time has always been now. At the time of the book of Matthew, when it was being written down, it was their belief that Jesus would come back in their lifetime. After all, he had already returned from the grave. He had already returned to them not only once, but multiple times, performing miracles and preaching on the kingdom of heaven. So when Christ said he was coming back, they knew it to be true. And while they didn't know the day or the hour, can you blame them for thinking that it would happen in their lifetime? As they aged, and many were martyred, and their light was beginning to dim, some fell into despair. Some relied on this parable for comfort, because the question was not if the bridegroom was going to return, it was when. The question was not if the Savior would return to us in our most desperate need, it is when. The main players of this parable today, the main character is not the bridegroom, although that's the subject. The main players are the bridesmaids. Of those willing to put in the preparation and reap the rewards, and those seeking earthly things now and missing out on something better later. Jesus commands us to stay awake with me, stand ready. In the scriptures, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ, and so it's appropriate that our lesson today, that this story is centered on a wedding. In this story, we expect the young women to be ready, because the bridegroom's coming will signal the beginning of a great and joyful feast, something that promises to be the highlights of these young women's lives. The theme is preparedness, not for the worst, but for the best. The wedding is supposed to be the highlight of this couple's life, something that they will remember fondly for the rest of their days. The foolish bridesmaids almost ruined everything, an offense beyond calculation. In this period in history, in this culture, it would have been an insult beyond reckoning. The parallel, of course, is Jesus' incarnation and crucifixion. The Son of God has come from heaven to live among us and to die on our behalf. He has provided us with the witness of Scripture and countless faithful disciples. He has offered us the Spirit to inspire, to guide, and direct our lives. He has given us a lifetime to get to know Him. If we reject Him, we can expect the door to be closed and locked. It is devastating to be rejected by the bridegroom because his word is final. The rejection is made even worse by the reputation for love and generosity of the bridegroom. It would be so easy to please him. Why did they not do so? Why do we not do so? Jesus makes it clear that he has expectations regarding our behavior, standards that we must take seriously, obedience to which we must aspire to, in this parable, he makes it clear that there is a time for repentance and a time when repentance will be too late. When the bridegroom comes, it will be too late to borrow oil, too late to ask for help, too late to pray, too late to read the Bible, too late for baptism, too late to get ready. When the door closes, it will be too late to plead for mercy. It will matter not how we wail and gnash our teeth. The door is shut. Once Christ has come, there will be no further opportunity to prepare. Those who will be ready will be included, and those who will not be ready will be excluded. That is what it means to prepare. Discipline or regret. No middle ground. It comes down to a choice on our part. A conscious choice on our part. The second coming is not popular preaching in mainline churches today. You don't hear it very often. But 
We must sound this truth and help people prepare. We are called to love. Love thy neighbor. Love our brothers and sisters. And if we truly love somebody, you don't sacrifice the truth. And the truth is Christ is the way. Christ is the truth. He is the life. And he's coming back. On the day of our judgment, nobody will find themselves in heaven or in hell accidentally. And when that day comes, the preparation of today will determine if we have discipline or regret. Amen. Will you please join with me in the words of the Apostles' Creed? you please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Holy God, rouse us to deep praise as we gather for worship. Enliven our worship with sincere and heartfelt song. Sustain the work of all church musicians and artists who lead us in praise and prayer. How can we keep from singing? Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Holy Judge, let justice roll down like waters over this world. Reign over the courtrooms of every land, in the hearts of those who guard the law and those who stand accused of crimes. Be present in cases where we long for both justice and mercy to prevail. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Companion, console those who feel lonely or abandoned. Lord, there are those in our own congregation with these feelings. Let their cries be heard. For those who crave congregation with their church family, give them peace in this trying time. They are not alone. Hear us, O oh God. Holy God, console those. Share the hours of those who live and eat alone. Grant healing touch to those who are ill, especially Diane, Brandy, Robert, Kip and Ridge, Betty, Jax, Betty, and our special friend, Elizabeth, in Ethiopia. Hear us, O God. Holy Protector, be with all observing Veterans Day on Wednesday. Guard the lives of active duty and retired military personnel. Comfort all who mourn those who have died in the line of duty. Heal the wounds both physically and mentally experienced by service members. Hear us, O oh God. Holy and immortal one, we pray in thanksgiving for the lives of all who have died. Remind us of the frailty and shortness of our own lives and inspire us to use them for the building up of your kingdom. Our time is short. We long for your coming. Hear us, O oh God. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever 
and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Please be seated.
Thank you, Bill Clare. If you'd please stand. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, Sovereign, Savior, and Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.